Welcome back to LDR 660 Strategic Planning. We're going to take a look at strategic issues in a broad sense in this segment. As with many of your graduate classes, in most cases, each slide could be expanded into its own individual segment. So let's start with a quote from Burns today. Pulitzer Prize winner, historian, political scientist, and leadership authority James McGregor Burns' transformational leadership theory appeals to the high road in developing social issues and individual purpose. His 1978 work, published by Harper and Rowe, is a classic and an excellent read from which we get this direct quote. The two essentials of power are motive and resource. The two are interrelated. Lacking motive, aspirations or goals, resource diminishes. Lacking resources, motives idle. Lacking either one, power collapses. Of course, transformational leadership theory has been expanded considerably since 1978, Bass and Avolio in particular, in the multi-factor leadership questionnaire. When analyzing history, the current environments in which our organizations operate and envisioning a future, those are three distinct activities, we must have a clear understanding of a firm's resources. Although you might not know it from how many American businesses in particular operate, the single most important resource in every organization is the people. The resource-based view, or RBV, is an important theoretical underpinning, at least implicitly, of the most widely used public strategic management models. But most public strategic management models don't show how key resources should link directly to achieving organizational goals or aspirations. That is, they don't show how to create a livelihood scheme. Bryson uses the term livelihood scheme, which is simply another variation of a business model to show how the organization operates. Resource C in the book outlines how to develop a livelihood scheme. Critical success factors are the actions an organization must do, criteria they must meet, or performance levels that must be achieved to meet stakeholder needs. In a simpler sense, resources are all of the inputs needed to produce the outcome. In a broader sense, it goes beyond time, talent, and treasure, and must include things like physical structures, organizational design, and the processes. You should understand competencies, the abilities to perform actions and processes the organization can manage, which lead to the desired outcomes. Distinctive competencies lead to competitive advantage. And particularly in a knowledge society, it's why people are the most important resource in the organization. In developing a strategic plan, understanding the core competency of the organization is required in meeting objectives. Core distinctive competency helps add value over competitors. Threshold competencies are skill sets that must be present for organizational survival, such as accounting, financial management, human resources, and IT. Though, depending on the size of the organization, many of those competencies are outsourced these days. As with anything, a good graphic is better than pages of text, and this one comes directly from Bryson. By undertaking this kind of organizational review, we have a better chance of creating a strategic plan and managing strategically to achieve our stated objectives. Additionally, we find areas of expertise that we're missing and that we need to develop to be relevant as an organization in the not-too-distant future. Strategic issues are the fundamental policy choices or challenges facing the organization. They arise on the organization's boundaries with its environment. They are something the organization can do something about. We don't care about things we can't change. Although it may not be easy, they are typically boundary-crossing, resource-intensive, absolutely politically loaded, irreversible, and highly consequential. Organizational culture is the glue that holds inputs, processes, and outputs together, affecting how strategic issues are framed and placed on the agenda and how we address them as an organization. My personal experience with many nonprofit organizations is that they consider their primary stakeholder to be the clients whom they serve. In reality, the most important client for any nonprofit organization is the one who provides the funding, actually for any organization. So uh, in a nonprofit, that would be the donors, because without their funding, the organization ceases to exist. In a for-profit world, it's the customers who purchase the products and services. And in a global economy, regardless of market size, very few organizations are the sole provider of a product or service, as we have many more competitors a buyer can choose from. So when we're looking at strategic focus, we need to address the need for change. We need to create a process to develop mission, vision, and values into daily practice. We need to produce programs, products, and services, control strategy delivery in the present, develop future capabilities, and maintain and build stakeholder, again, stakeholder, not stockholder, relations. 
From the work by Bryson, as we arrive at an overarching organizational strategy, there must be subunit strategies below for each department or unit, which then leads to programs, products, or services offered into the marketplace, and the internal function strategies, which enable the organization to operate. We've talked about this previously, but depending on the model you're using, there are varying terms in strategic planning that describe essentially the same thing. So you have to make sure that within your team, everyone holds the same meanings, whether you're discussing goals goals, strategies, objectives, tactics, action plans, or any variety of strategic planning terms. From both week one in class and from your discussion threads on various strategic planning models, you should have come to understand that there are many terms used by different experts and in different models. Clarifying what these terms mean to you, and more importantly to those you're working with, is key to being on the same page. This version is a combination of Hoshin Conry and Balance Scorecard. As Bryson discusses, strategies are not tactics. Tactics are short-term adaptive actions and reactions used to accomplish limited objectives. Strategies provide a continuing basis for ordering the adaptations to more broadly conceived purposes. We at the top have an overarching goal, breakthrough focus. It's very important to the organization's vision. We have a key strategy that will help us achieve the goal. Initiatives that are tied to the strategies below the goal. And then we have tactics and direct actions. Creating a strategic plan without putting measurements in place is a complete waste of time. Within the overriding goal, there must be a measure of success. If we choose too many strategies which lead us towards that goal, we won't be able to focus enough on any one objective and something will fall through the cracks, leading to disappointment and failure. We've previously talked about setting up small wins, places that accomplishment can be celebrated. Bryson will tell you at some place you may have to choose to just go for the big win. So as we move strategies into the tactical or actions level, we need to set targets that can be measured. Otherwise, how do we know when we've arrived? How we bring the team and eventually the entire organization together is through the discussion and communication of issues and ideas that reach to the heart of each participant in some way. As all stakeholders don't have identical needs or worldviews, this requires leadership to understand what each level of stakeholder requires and what is universal among stakeholder groups. This isn't to say that you're going to try to be all things to all people because that's a clear recipe for failure. And as we'll discuss at another time with Bryson, that's why we put together stakeholder power grids to understand where the power lies. Bryson suggests framing strategic issues as questions, in part because if there isn't anything we can do about the issue, then it's not really strategic for us. Secondly, an effective strategic plan has to have action or activities or it's a waste of time. So framing issues as questions allows us to better apply tactics that answer the question. Thirdly, it helps us focus the organization on what we can control and do something about. If you've looked at funnel theory previously in any of your classes, we continue to narrow down to a point where we make choices about the activities that will lead us to accomplishing our mission and our vision. Ideas strongly influence how people interpret their interests, how people assess costs and benefits of strategies, the nature of winning and losing arguments. Much of the front end of Bryson's strategic planning process is designed to keep people from jumping to conclusions about what the issues are. Strategic issues sometimes are discussed during the normal course of our daily activities in the organization, particularly in a volatile global economy or political marketplace where adaptability and the need to change course can happen abruptly. The direct approach is appropriate when there is a lack of clarity about goals and vision. The goals approach is more traditional, and once goals and objectives have been set, then the issues arise in discussion of how to meet those goals. In some cases, we'll have a prior strategic plan with a balanced scorecard approach to what we've been measuring so we can adjust for the new direction. If we have a clear vision of success for what the organization will look like in the future, then the issues arise out of getting from where we are now to fulfilling that vision. The indirect approach most often comes about when members of the team and or leadership are unclear about direction, beyond knowing that some level of change is necessary. The systems analysis approach is highly complex and requires expertise in the field, as well as longer meaning and planning time. Rummel and Brock's Improving Performance from Josie Bass, 1995, is an excellent guide for mapping out the white spaces in an organization that prevent effective flow of information and resources across the firm horizontally. And finally, from this list by Bryson, their alignment approach simply helps clarify where gaps and conflicts exist between where we want to be and how we operate now. How often have we heard the phrase, that's not how we do it here, or this is how we've operated for 20 years? 
That's why the old rule, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, is a crutch that inhibits organizational change and growth. More appropriately, as multiple researchers have shown, break all the rules, as in the book subtitle from the 12 Rules of Management by Gallup, which we've discussed in previous classes. Tensions arise out of preservation of traditions, innovation and change, and change is constant and all around us. Human resources, and especially equity concerns, productivity improvements, any issue should be tested against the different tensions separately and in combination in order to find the best way to frame the issue. Depending on the size of the organization and the number of participants on the planning team, you're bound to have some conflict in these discussions. But if you remember again our previous discussions from Heifetz and Bryson, constructive conflict is absolutely necessary for organizational growth and relationship development among team members. We want to clarify related strengths and distinctive competencies. Articulate related weaknesses. Be clear about the opportunities and understand the challenges or threats involved. Explore the links to mission and mandates if we have them. And understand the consequences of not addressing these issues. The appreciative inquiry approach to organizational change developed by David Cooper Ryder advises focusing on what's working within the organization as opposed to many organizational change strategies that focus on what's not working. Bryson's advising us to create effective strategies that build on strengths, especially the distinctive competencies that set us apart from our competitors, that take advantage of opportunities, that minimize or overcome our weaknesses, challenges, and threats, that further our mission, meet whatever mandates we have, and most importantly, create public value. If we're not creating value for our customers, our community, our stakeholders, what's the point? Whatever issues the organization faces are in some ways related to each other. This issue, Mac, ties back to the PennDOT case study we looked at in week one. Analyzing the issues in this way, just laying them out in a grid, will help you understand which issues are crucial. It will also help you figure out where to start and begin to develop effective strategies for the organization. Building our strategies off of our competencies and distinctive competencies builds value creation through our actions towards achieving our mission. Again, our competencies and distinctive competencies help lead to our actions which support our strategies, reaching our goals to fulfill our mission. And again, from the Department of Why, as Daniel Pink would say, determining the purpose and continually asking, why are we doing this? Why would we do that? Helps focus organizational strategies in ways that appeal to the key stakeholders. Purposes do come in hierarchies. One of the most important management processes of all of it is to start with a purpose and engage in a purpose expansion. Choose that purpose that fits your new sense of opportunity. Let that purpose be your guide and always keep asking yourself, what's our real purpose here? Why are we here? Change your purpose when it's the wise thing to do. As we're developing strategies and clarifying our purposes, the internal environmental scan should reveal whether we're dealing with developmental or non-developmental issues. Developmental issues involve tensions that pull the organization in different directions, require substantial repositioning in terms of our core business, basic strategies, and or key practices, and require a vision that must be created showing what's wanted. Non-developmental issues have less ambiguity, don't require major repositioning in terms of our business strategies, core business, or key practices, and can be addressed based on decision premises that may be inferred from much of the current practice. But 50% of non-developmental issue decisions fail, primarily because of premature commitments, poor investments, and failure pwn practices. The failures involve not heading in the right direction. They typically occur when we're misreading the environment, whether it's external or internal. They can also occur when process management and process improvement activities extend beyond the area of effectiveness, driving out loose coupling and knowledge exploration in the interests of tight coupling and knowledge exploitation. Let's repeat that. Loose coupling is knowledge exploration. Tight coupling is knowledge exploitation where folks don't share knowledge within the organization but hold on to it for personal gain. Successes occur when the claims of key stakeholders are reconciled, when clear directions are set, and a lot of different options are considered. Implementation is planned based on careful consideration of social and political forces and the participation of key actors, as some leaders would say, the champions of the cause. 
sorting out the issues again. We see non-developmental. There is need for more knowledge exploitation and tight coupling, and that does happen. Strategic planning team works on the strategies. The operations team will work on the operations side of it. On the developmental side, there's more need for knowledge exploration and loose coupling. And for the system, governing boards, senior staff, citizens, the overarching vision of the organization, and the goals, again, that fit within the organization. As we've said before, a strategic plan should be a living, breathing document. So in continual analysis, we're deciding what to keep, what to drop, and what we need to add in. New development in areas of visions and goals, changing the architecture because of new technologies or change in our stakeholders, refinement of the existing work that improve the existing architecture of the organization, tightening up the strategic plan or our processes, process improvement, and de-development, the stop agenda. We just don't need to be doing that anymore because it's no longer relevant. Leadership is, of course, crucial. Well-led and managed organizations are good at dealing with both developmental and non-developmental issues. Good leadership at all levels of the organization is key, with appropriate attention given to vision and goals, strategy formulation, strategic programming, and process management and process improvement. As Jim Collins would say, from good to great, get the right person on the bus. To conclude this session, strategic issue identification is the heart of the strategic planning process. Remember, issues and ideas basically drive politics. How you identify strategic issues, the process you use to do that is not as important as how well you've identified the issues individually and figured out who the right people in the organization are to address them. And really pay attention to articulating what the existing, whether it's implicit or explicit, livelihood scheme or business model is as a prelude to perhaps developing a new one. Remember that nothing stops an organization faster than people who believe that the way you worked yesterday is the best way to work tomorrow. That's from John Madonna, the current CEO of Digital Think and the former CEO of international consultant KMPG. That's it for this segment on issues. We're going to look at strategy formulation in our next segment.